this year, let, let me begin with what happened last year. Um, the, I forced a vote, and it, I'll take responsibility or I'll take uh, the blame, for forcing a vote on right to work in the Senate. And I did that for a couple of reasons. Um, some years ago, there was a former speaker and president pro tem that stood in front of Springfield audience business community and said there's going to be a vote on right to work and it never happened. And Wass and I thought that that needs to, um, that promise needs to be kept. So what we did, um, we looked at the House of Representatives and felt that there wasn't enough votes to do that, or we weren't sure. The speaker was in a little bit of a turmoil. So we decided to force the vote, and, and with the help of Mike Parson and his committee, we got the votes out of his committee, uh, uh, got the votes in the Senate, and pushed it over to the House, not knowing if they had 109 to override the veto, but was willing to roll the dice. So, uh, I mean, Mike and Jay and I took a political risk, political risk in our career. You know, Mike's running statewide, and, and you know, the, the, but we felt we had to keep our word. So with that, we did something that is rare and unique, which is move the previous question in the Missouri Senate. That's only been done several times um, in recent history. We did it on some right to work issues and some other things. Um, and I think what we did is make it an issue for the governor's race. And if you listen to the governors, I think they're all either on one side or the other, either yes or no. So I think that's probably a good thing. Southwest Missouri has been waiting. As Brenda and I talked to him, men go, that's one thing that we've been waiting for a vote for, you know, 60 years down here. If we're going to compete with Oklahoma, Kansas, Tennessee, all the southern states. Um, if you look down there, that's where the growth is. Um, if you look where all the automotive manufacturers, that's a BMW, Kia, Mercedes, all been built, in Boeing, you know, Boeing said they didn't go to South Carolina because of the right to work, but you read between the lines. Um, these, now, moving forward to the session, uh, Tom Dempsey left, the president pro tem the Senate left early. A little bit of a surprise. Um, uh, my job is to appoint chairman. Now, we left the chairman the way they were. Uh, we didn't change any chairman. And my job now is to uh, send legislation to committees. And the the legislation that our leadership team, which Jay and Mike are part of, is uh, twofold, labor reform and tort reform. Now, it's been the practice of trying to uh, uh, send uh, legislation, dribble it out, dribble it out. I've uh, I sent uh, all the pre-filed legislation, which is 300 pieces of, of legislation, I sent a third out of them last Thursday, I'm going to send a third out of them today, and the rest of them will send next Thursday. Which means all legislation on tort reform, labor reform, tax reform, um, business reform, pushback on the overreach of the Fed. We got real ID issues with, you've, you've read about that on, on, um, on what's going on with the Fed. The Second Amendment, First Amendment, all, we're, we're getting to committee, and what's going to happen is the chairman should start hearing committee uh, bills this week and next week. That way we can get it to the floor. Majority leader can get this legislation out and uh, get some debate on it right away. The speaker and I have a really good relationship, Todd Richardson, and he's doing the same thing on his side. So our goal is to get things out. We're going to start the budget and start it early again. So if the governor decides to, to um, um, veto something in the budget, we have a chance to override during session, which is the same thing we did last year. Um, it looks like the revenue is around 4% growth. Um, we, we probably going to have a couple hundred million dollar supplemental in January, which most of it's going to end up going to part of the Medicaid expansion. Now, we didn't expand Medicaid, but because of a lot of people that qualify for it, I mean, we have to go with the federal guidelines. So we're going to end up having to probably pay for a few extra people and children going on Medicaid. So. That's going to be a, a January issue. We'll wait for the governor's speech on uh, his state of the state to see where we go. Uh, the speaker and I have been pretty clear that there's not going to be a polarizing influence between one side of the building and the other. Uh, usually there's uh, snippets from sometimes that, uh, and I did it too when I was Speaker of the House, 
and I couldn't get along with the president of the Senate, the majority leader of the Senate, I'd say, well, it's their fault. It's not our fault. And they'd say, well, it's Richard's fault, not our fault. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. Sometimes that makes good press, but doesn't it work good in the building of trying to make partnerships and try to push things along? So that's not going to happen. And, and uh, the speaker and I meet um, at least twice a week. Uh, last week we met at 6 o'clock in the morning, um, and then the other we, we met uh, late at night. So um, I think on tort reform, I think what you'll see, we're going to see all the bills sent to committee, but we're going to focus on um, two of them. Those two are yet to be determined in the next week or 10 days. And then next year we're going to focus on two more. I think the small approach on tort reform and, 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 and this reform of, uh, of uh, frivolous lawsuits, it makes sense if all the business community and all the legislators focused on one or two items, get those done. If you focus on too much, um, uh, you just can't have too, many, have too much legislation. It uh, doesn't focus on what you're interested in. I'd rather have a win, a win, a win, and then next year get a couple more wins. Um, Election year, there'll be a lot of speeches on the Senate floor. No, no offense to uh, Senator Parson, but uh, I think Senator Schaefer started last week, didn't he, Mike? <laughs> so, uh, Mike's one of the good guys. Uh, I mean, he did all of our ag bills, our farm bills. Uh, he chairs commerce, does insurance, so uh, Mike's one of the good guys. Uh, Make sure he watches your back around here. Jay uh, does registrations and elections, and uh, you got two really good people up here, and I count on them a lot, so. Uh, uh, having Southwest Missouri in the legislature is a good thing because St. Louis and Kansas City cannot do anything without Southwest Missouri because we have all the votes. No offense, Charlie, but the Republican majority is what controls how far we're going to go on anything. And, and uh, Southwest Missouri, Springfield and Joplin, Mount Vernon, uh, yes, but it's actually the people that think like us or everybody south of Kansas City, Lake of the Ozarks, Middle Missouri, and uh, West St. Louis County. That's Southwest Missouri's thinking. So we have the votes to do just about anything you want to do or stop anything you want to do. And that's been the case since about 2004. Um, again, election year um, is a pivotal year, I think, um, not only in Washington, D.C., but in Jefferson City decide where we're going to go. If, if issues that uh, Brenda and I talk about and her husband Jim and I have talked about it for years, if you want to succeed in, in um, uh, crossing off and nexing off some of these items, it's important that you help get the vote out, whichever you believe in. If you believe in those issues or you don't, then, but this is the time to be engaged. And as Gordon knows, he'll be in the fight and the fray too. So it's important that you're engaged and um, that's about as political as I'll be. Uh, I, uh, I try to get along with the governor. I do about half the time, cause I, but I did that with Matt Blunt about half the time. But there is a, there is a, uh, there's always a battle between the executive branch and legislative branch of who's in charge and who's in control. And I like to protect the legislative branch. Uh, that's why I'm a little bit nervous sometimes about ballot initiatives, because ballot initiatives, whether you like them or not, I'm. I'm not really in favor of them. They go around the legislative process, not letting debate and not letting the legislature vote on it and let you know how the legislature feels about them. Um, so I'm a little nervous about ballot initiatives. And the fact that we don't have a Secretary of the State in the Republican Party, we have to be really careful what the language is because sometimes you, they'll write it backwards and you have to vote no to be a yes and a yes to vote no and then confuses the electorate and, and sometimes you get unintended consequences. I had a question a minute ago about term limits. Well, do I like term limits? Well, if it hadn't been for them, I probably wouldn't have been in the, in the uh, legislature. Um, I think it's good to throw the bums out once in a while, but I will tell you when you throw them out, you leave, the, you leave a lot of uh, knowledge with the bureaucrats and the lobbyists. So there's about as much good as there is bad. So. But it doesn't, ha it doesn't hurt to have new blood, and it doesn't hurt to, when it's my time to go away. Um, so with that, do you have any questions or anything? I'm not sure who, I know Mr. Greasemer, I know a few people here. Is any, if you have a question, so you might tell me who you are because I haven't spoke to Springfield Group in a couple of years, so. So I, and I'll just say, Show Me Institute is a nonpartisan 
organization. We don't get involved in politics or party. Just so I've, I've tried to be nonpartisan, Brenda. Were, you were. I, I, we want to open it up to questions. We have a lot of back and forth. And if I could kick it so, off. Um, don't ask me one of them lawyer questions, will you, Brenda? <laughs> well, could you give us an idea when you talk about tort reform and labor reform? What kind of reforms are you talking about that we might expect to see move through, through the legislature? Um, I would, uh, expert witness is, a, is one that uh, we didn't finish last year, I think you can see that, and collateral source are the two I think we're going to focus on. That's not to say, Brenda, there may be one other one, but those are the ones that the business community and, and the leadership is focusing on, those two. Labor reform, recertification, as you and I talked early, of unions. And, and some form of maybe paycheck protection. Those are the two. Um, I don't think we can get the votes out of the House on, on right to work again. The Speaker uh, is not sure, and I'm not gonna take it up unless I get 109 votes. Um, I put my guys in a heck of a mess with that. Uh, and the Democrats, the Democrats didn't really appreciate. Let me tell you about the Senate. Debate, you can talk as long as you want on any subject for as long as you want. Now, there's a balance in the Senate. There should be a balance in the U.S. Senate, which is filibuster is a rare use of, of, of uh, discussing or debating. And I don't mind a filibuster. They can go as long as they want, as long as it ends up uh, with a negotiation or trying to come to consensus and try to, to negotiate on a final bill. Now, if it's used to kill legislation, particularly on legislation that, that is in favor of my party, I, uh, uh, at some point in time, you have to strike that balance, and that's when I am not opposed to using the previous question, which strikes that balance. Both of them should be used rare, um, um, and generally they are. So that's how, that's how I feel about that. Labor, that's about the labor reform and, and, the, and the tort so far, Brenda. But, there's always something that happens middle of the session that's a surprise, whether it's a job creation bill, whether it's a, a labor reform. Uh, we got, the speaker's priority is ethics reform. He believes he um, um, has some ideas on how to change the culture in Jeff City. Um, I'm letting him do that and send it over to us. We'll see what happens. I mean, the culture in Jeff City is just like the culture in every community, every every. Uh, uh, in every world, you got good and bad. You got people that are there for the right reasons, the wrong reasons. And, you know, do you legislate ethics? I'm not sure you can, but there is some things that we can do about um, uh, some of the lobbying efforts and some of the undue influences inside and outside the building. So we're going to try to strike that balance too. So I hope that was a little bit informative. I'm not sh sure if. Uh, I tried to hit everything I could think of. Mike, Jay, did I forget anything? Why don't you guys talk briefly about what's in front of your committees, what you're looking forward to. Why don't you come up here and give me a hand with this? <laughs> well, I mean, these two guys, what I've done is sending legislation to these guys early is empower the chairman to decide what's important, particularly Southwest Missouri, and they can tell you what's going to be in front of their committees, and you can talk to them too. So. Well, we won't, in my committees, probably one of the first things we probably will have is voter ID because I do have elections. <clears throat> so that will probably be one of the first bills that we'll hear. Um, there's some other, I, I have professional registration, which is anybody that has to be licensed uh, to do what they do in the state of Missouri. I also have banking and I also have elections under, under the committee. Um, we probably will have a what we call a sunset bill this year. Um, I've come to, I, I just believe that most people that come to me these days wanting to be licensed, want, they want to be licensed so they can make more money. Um, I'm pretty much against most new licensing bills. Um, the sunset bill doesn't, doesn't mean that no one will ever be licensed again. It just means that we will ask a lot of pertinent questions why you want to be licensed. Uh, show us why. Show us the problem that's out there other than you just want to restrict who can do what you do so the price goes up. 
Um, that is one bill I think that uh, will be out early and uh, we'll see what happens with it. Um, you know, another bill that I'm doing, um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of talk about it one way or the other. There are people who want to have an open convention. I've heard some of that nationally. I heard the governor of Texas yesterday uh, wanted to have more of an open convention uh, for uh, an Article 5 to add amendments uh, to the Constitution. I don't believe, personally, for me, I don't think that's the way to go. I don't want a wide open convention. I think when you open up that, any kind of amendment, any kind of thing can happen. However, I do think there is an opportunity here to do what, what is a pact, basically, between states. And if you can get 28 states to agree to it, it happens. And then it would take 34 states to ratify it. So it's an extremely high bar. But what I want to do is have a pact for one issue and one issue only, and that's a balanced budget. Um, I think if we could have Washington balance their budget, we would solve 80% of the problems that most of us have with Washington. You can't tell me government can't balance a budget. I've been there for 14 years. We've done it every year. You can. Government can balance a budget. Um, I don't think that's anything that's horrible to ask for, is spend what you bring in. Uh, so I will have a bill this year. It will probably come through my committee. Uh, to have a pack to put Missouri on the road to have to join a pack with 28 other states if we can get them all there to have a one issue uh, article 5 convention and our people and everybody every state's uh, people would be bound to only being able to talk about that one issue only vote on that one issue nothing else um, I think we can do that I think we can do it legally and I think it's important. The founders gave us a way out. If the federal government gets too big, this is what we're supposed to do. See, I, part of that is that 10th Amendment, you know, the pushback, the overreach. You know, we still have rights as a state to push back on the federal government. So what Jay's trying to do is protect the 10th Amendment. So we're trying to protect the 1st Amendment, the 2nd Amendment, the 10th Amendment. You saw what happened the other week on, on gun rights and stuff, whether you're gunny or not. The fact of it is that, the, that the, uh, these presidential initiatives are taking away your ability to do what the founders gave you, so this is something else we're taking a look at. So that's I mean, most, mostly what I'm going to be doing. <clears throat> well, I just want to echo what Ronnie said a while ago when he said he's going to kind of hit the ground running. It's basically what he said. It'll be the first time I've had a committee hearing this early in session, but I actually have my first one tomorrow, and it has to do with tort reform right out of the box. So He's handled most of the tort reform we're sending to his committee because we can trust him to get it out in good shape. I did that. I did, we did right to work last year. I know Ronnie was big on that. Uh, and, and, uh, but the truth of the matter on right to work is not going to happen to you have a Republican governor. So whether you like it or whether you don't, that's, that's the combination it'll take to get that done, uh, I believe. You know, I, I, I just want to talk a couple issues I think are facing the state of Missouri that we've got to figure out a solution to as a legislator. And one of those a big deal to me is a skilled workforce. If you look at the state of Missouri, we have fell way behind on the skilled for, workforce side. And, and we've got to figure out the solution to that. For one, for the current businesses you have in the state or for new business coming into this state, we've got to figure that out. And I think uh, an example I use a lot of times, 20, 25 years ago, when we talked about a college degree, everybody just basically says you've got to have a college degree. That's kind of, really didn't matter what it was as long as you had a four-year degree in a lot of areas. Today, it, it, it's much more tech savvy. There's much more science involved in it. And you got to meet the demands of the workforce. And I think that's something that, uh, I know Ronnie's always been involved in, in that workforce and trying development, and Jay both, but that's something I really think we've got to take a good look at and see well, how do we do that? And do we need to go back to the high school level where we start talking about both tech jobs to start screening those people to make sure they're going to be available for that market? And what's the demand out there when you get out there? Uh, because, you know, it's pretty tough anymore when you go out there and your job pays 30000 for the four-year degree, it's pretty hard to do anything when there's a lot of jobs out there that we got to do. I think that's one thing. I think transportation's an issue we got to figure out a solution to in the state of Missouri. I mean, you just can't turn your back on that and say you're not going to do anything because I, one of the responsibilities we have is to make sure that our infrastructure in this state, whether it's highways, whether it's airports, <laughs> whether it's ports, is going to be a big deal in the future of Missouri. And if you look where Missouri is in the national level, you're at the crossroads of almost every infrastructure piece that's going to be in the United States, whether it's highways, whether it's rivers, 
whether it's airports, all come through Missouri. And, and I think for the future, we've got, we got to be looking at that. Agriculture is a big deal to me. Uh, I've held about every agriculture issue. I've dealt with about everyone. Unfortunately, most of them almost seems like it's been controversial. Uh, all the way from the puppy mill language that I first started out with, the divided the state 50-50. Uh, we did right to farm, which was a big deal to me, getting that put in the Constitution. But, you know, most of our issues in the state of Missouri, I'm going to say this. If Missourians can handle our problems, regardless where you are on the issues, then let Missourians handle them. But what I don't like is all the influence we get from the East or the West Coast coming into our state, and people basically want to dictate the initiative petition process how we do business, how we conduct ourselves in this state. And I'm just a big believer in, hey, there's a border to the state, there's a reason for that border, and we need to do that on that. I, so I really think there's some opportunities this year to do some good things, although it's election year, I understand that. But I think some of the things, as Ronnie said earlier, you know, you can't hit a home run in Jeff City every day. It's not meant to hit a home run. It's meant to do pieces at a time. That's what the bureaucracies, that's what the process is about sometimes, to make sure it's done right. And I think that's, that's, that's important. One thing I agree with Jay 100%, our federal government, whether you're Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter, except in this room this morning, the only way I truly believe that the federal government will ever come back within its powers is a balanced budget amendment. It's the only way I think that the government, the federal government's gonna do that. And what it's gonna take, it's going to, they're gonna force that, quote, upon the states to take action to stand up against the federal government. At some point, the states are gonna to have to do that. And let me just give you one example. When Matt Blunt was governor many, many years ago, we took some critical votes up there on the Medicaid expansion, uh, on, on the, even the Affordable Care Act, I'll tie that in here in just a minute. And we took some bullets for that, that because programs we cut. If we hadn't cut them programs today, we couldn't balance the budget in Missouri for love or money. That's just the truth of it is. This year with the Affordable Care Act that's going to be implemented in Missouri, we'll add, Ronnie, I believe it's 100,000 more people. That's, on, that's part of our supplemental we're going to have to pay for, right? 100,000 more people on the rolls. Now, let me just tell you what that 100,000 means. That means one million people in the state of Missouri out of almost six million are going to be somewhere on the government rolls. One in every six people sitting in this room will be somehow affiliated. So when you walk out today and you look around, almost one million people will be on some sort of government rolls when we walk out of this building today. You cannot survive and keep continuing that pattern in the state of Missouri when we have to balance the budget and they don't. It just won't work. Um, on, on some uh, tax reform, we have uh, legislation on the committee on the earnings tax for St. Louis and Kansas City. That'll be in committee um, next week, this week, and that'll be debated. I know you have, your organization has some thoughts on that too. Other tax reform, uh, Eric Schmidt in St. Louis is looking at corporate income tax again. Um, and um, the, uh, the bill he passed uh, a year or two ago should be kicking in on, on some uh, corporate tax relief. Uh, so, I mean, it, small bits, small snippets, that's kind of where we're headed. Um, I will tell you that I forgot about that when Matt was governor, that uh, the Senate came over and all but uh, tried to put a chopping block on the House of Representatives uh, to expand Medicaid, and we stood strong and we probably kept the program somewhat from growing clear out of bounds or we wouldn't have been unaffordable if the house stood strong. I mean, and we passed that uh, standard with me just by like one or two votes. I mean, it was a tough, the house had a tough time on that one. And, but we, we stood strong and backed up the governor on that. Um, I'll tell you a story on, you remember when um, we was going through that, uh, those issues and the feds were sending all that money to the states, um, I forget what they called it back then, but uh, um, we weren't going to take it. The House of Representatives, that uh, all that relief money, uh, when the stock market and everything's done, in, I don't know, several, it was a billion dollars or several billion dollars. And we were going to take it. Well, the Vice President of the United States called us and said, if you don't take it, we're going to cut back all your federal funding, pass through money on health care, transportation, education. So what we did is we took it, but we backfilled education 
and, uh, and sent it to the school districts and, and uh, didn't spend it on health care as the Fed would like to have done that. So we try to be fiscal responsible as we can. And uh, so, yeah, you have any questions? We can't afford it. And besides that, every time you go by a hospital, you see a crane. Now, if there's a damn short of money, how come there's a crane outside each hospital? Give me a break. Look, I, I'm a firm believer in alternative sentencing. If it's a nonviolent crime, I'm a firm believer in that. I don't think putting people in penitentiary all the time is always the answer. Now, it sounds good politically. Don't get me wrong, because when I first went up there, every lawmaker almost wants to do something to show they're a crime fighter. That's probably not always the best scenario. Because just let me put it in there. The prison system is the sixth largest education institution in the state of Missouri. That's not what we want. That's where everybody's getting their high school diplomas. That's where they're taking education from or sitting there. So I'm a big fan of alternative sentencing. We, government bureaucracy, and government in itself is so outdated sometimes. For example, we're using the same technology we were using when I was sheriff back in the 1990s, <coughs> the 80s, of how we monitor somebody, you know, with a leg bracelet or, or however you want to do it. <coughs> Let me tell you something. Take any one of your iPhones out today, and somebody can about to tell you where you're at this morning, if you want to look. And there's no reason we're not using technology. And again, put these people out, have them do something constructive in their lives. Most people in the prison systems are not bad, bad people. They've made a lot of terrible choices for, for multiple reasons. But, you know, I, I think you got to really take a look at that and see, okay, who can go back out to society and be productive? Now, don't get me wrong, and I, and I don't want everybody to think, to think, oh, he's soft on crime, you know, because that's one thing. I think there's no sheriff, uh, how I believe. But I also know through mandated sentencing sometimes. I'll tell you an example. It's a touchy subject, and I'll just bring it up some more. You know, the sex offender list. Now, everybody gets a little squirmy when you talk about that. Do I believe somebody should be branded for life on the sex offender list? I don't. And that's a very political hot topic. But here's why, and I'll give you a perfect example in my church. I've got a gentleman when I was sheriff went through it, and he's a sex offender from here on out. Married to gal, the young lady that this all took place with. They have two children, and they sit in the same church I sat in her 30s now. And that kid, not a kid anymore, was branded for life on the sex offender list. There's got to be a way that we we can we can do alternative things in those particular cases. Now, look, if you if some guy's a pervert or whatever you want to call him, and it's some kid, believe me, I got grandkids. You know, <clears throat> I don't know what I would do if I was in that particular case. But now there is people that have problems with that, and they're repeat offenders. But I think the whole system needs to be overhauled myself. And Senator Bob Dixon from Springfield, too, uh, took three years to pass a complete overhaul of our sentence guideline, and so that should be kicking in this year, so that's going to make some effect to your point. There's plenty of programs out there where we're trying to enhance that. And I'll even go back to skilled workforce for trying to do both of those. Right. Trying to get in these kind of, how do you get those people to work? You know, because you know, if you've been in prison, you know, I, I, you know, who knows what their future is? What, right. You know, it's their choice what road they go down. But what the heck? I'd rather give them a skill out here through OTC, trying to figure out how can you do a trade as a mechanic? How can you do something that maybe is just the bulk work of things better than sitting in prison? And we're trying to incentivize, as the gentlemen have said, that uh, getting, getting credits, high school and college credits, that you can get college credits in high school, start early, um, uh, get to the trade school, as the senators have said, and same thing through the prison system, if, uh, and try to get them on their path to a, uh, a better life. So. Well, we're not turning away your money. We've, we've, uh, 
we've had it, we've got enough money to have the federal match for the next four or five years. So we're not going to be turning away money. With the new federal program that, that uh, Congress did, uh, uh, we should be uh, going from six, seven hundred million dollars of maintenance, repair, and construction, maybe up to over a billion with the new federal money and the fact that we can match it. The f what we're looking for is uh, uh, mechanisms to guarantee that we have the match and expand transportation. And as, as the two senators said, we're looking, I mean, if you look at Highway 60, going to the ports over to Mississippi with the Panama Canal going to open up this year, I think it's important to the trucking industry in Southwest Missouri that we can get that, that, uh, that we have access to ports. It's not that far over to, over to the Mississippi River anymore. So um, rail, ports, roads, Highway 70, and, and right behind uh, 70 is uh, Highway 44. Now, to your point on, on uh, major highways, there is a, I mean, there's a couple alternatives we're looking at, and, and I think we're going to roll out another one that's not been very public. Uh, we're just trying to work through the mechanisms. That Highway 70, we may try to develop a hot lane, which is six lanes, a metal lane uh, uh, that it'll be told but you can drive on it if you want to pay, go the extra speed, extra weight. If you want to go free, you go in the other two lanes. Uh, we'd sell that to vendors around the world or somebody who bid on There's a number of people that do that, a number of institutions, and build Highway 70 with a hot lane. One toll lane, the other two free. So you can either toll if you want to go something extra, quicker, and get that thing done. Now, it couldn't be done on all 70. It'd have to be done where there is um, uh, support along Highway 70, and that may be the model for 44 down the road between uh, Joplin and Springfield and on up through Rolla, so we'll see, but uh, we aren't going to miss out on those dollars. I think we've got to put everything back on the table again. I mean, you can talk gas tax, but a penny on a gallon of gas is worth $28 million. You're going to have to raise a whole lot of pennies on gas to raise enough money to do anything. Uh, Toll roads are certainly an answer. It may be a combination of all these things that we have to do. Um, you know, I, 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 we certainly, we've worked on it for years. Yeah, there's talk about taking the highway patrol out of general revenue, go to go and ask the people to pass a tax to protect highway patrol, take that couple hundred million dollars highway patrol and, towards, and take it towards um, uh, uh, transportation. That's just an alternative, that's just a suggestion, nothing's happened. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. I think what's gonna happen, uh, we're going to have some scenarios I think we can roll out, but something on a real massive plan will probably have to wait for the governor, and you know we'll have a governor, whoever it is, in another few months. I do. I don't know what Kansas has done. I do know there is. Even if I told you that I wanted to expand. Obamacare, which I do not, there is not votes in the House or Senate to pass it. So it's just moot. We are not going to pass Medicaid expansion. There is not the support. So what about these hospitals? Do you just see them drying up then? Um, I think they're going to be what's happening in Missouri. I mean, you know, St. John's in Joplin and, and, and St. John's in, in Springfield. Uh, I mean, it's going to be regional. It's going to be merging. You know, I, I wish I had an answer. I know the hospital association, you think you get a lot of pressure on these guys. We get a lot of pressure. The hospitals are big dogs in the state capitol, and they want that pretty bad. Well, it's probably going to happen just be clinics. That's what's going to happen. That's what's happening in rural Missouri. The hospitals are, we got hospital in Hayti and the one Lamar, I mean, it's more of a clinic of St. John's and, and Freeman now. Yeah. I think Tom did to go along with that because I have a lot of those rural hospitals in my, matter of fact, the hospitals in my central district are the largest employer in my district if you total them all up. But there's just some of those rural hospitals that's just not going to make it. Right. For, and it's just kind of unfortunate the way it is because, I mean, I grew up in a very small town and, you know, we used to go to Bolivar to trade or Bolivar went to Springfield to trade. And the reason you move to Bolivar anymore, the reason people move to Springfield normally is because of infrastructure, what we just talked about this morning, education, and hospitals. 
that's why people go to those areas. And, and unfortunately, I'm a small town boy at heart, but the, the reality of it is you can't survive in today's with the technology you got to have in the medical arena, you know, let's just face it, what Ron and him say, and, and where I come from, most doctors are not going to go on go live in the weekend, Missouri. I think telemedicine is going to be bigger. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, you get in technology um, and uh, the universities in, in this region are, are bigger in telemedicine. Uh, I think that's going to be very important. And then, you know, um, I don't know. Wish I had an answer for everything, but I'm not going to lie to you, I don't. Anybody else? Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>